This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Welcome back to Biblical Life TV. We're going to uh, deal today, this uh, teaching session is going to contain the weight and power of carrying the name of God, parts three and four. I want to look at how seriously the early church took of carrying the name of God. Let's go to Acts chapter 7, verses 39 through 43. This can also tie in when I dealt with how that when Peter on the day of Pentecost, he preached judgment because he said the, the one that Moses promised that would come, that we have been told that if we reject him that we would not be held guiltless. You not only rejected him, but you crucified him. And so Stephen, while they're bringing allegations against him, he actually stands in the court of God, if you will, before men, and he brings allegations against them and how that they have not carried the name of God properly in the earth. Acts chapter 7, starting with verse 39. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turn back again to Egypt. He's talking about Moses, saying to Aaron, let us... Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And they made a golden calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. You know, as I'm reading this, because it's not an indictment against the Jewish people, it's an indictment against all humanity, because what they did in the first covenant, we've been doing in the second covenant. Okay? Then God turned and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered unto me slain beasts and sacrifice by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Now look at verse 34, or 43. And yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech. Now who brought Molech back into Israel? Solomon. With his wives, he brought the, the, altar, the temple of Molech and the altar of Ashtaroth. And... And the star of your God, Rimphan, figures ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away unto Babylon. So by them bringing that in and perpetrating it, though when you, when you look at the star of, uh, of do, 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 Rimphan, everything that I could find in all of my reference materials talks about what today is, is referred to as the star of David. In fact, there's one ancient talisman that I found on one side, and this is dedicated to Rimphan. It's, a, it's also an Egyptian god. That on one side is a pentapha, or a five-pointed star, and on the other side is a six-pointed star. Both are identified with this pagan god. But what's interesting is it is also 
linked, the, the, the star of Rimfan is also linked to Saturn. And Saturn is very, very big in pagan worship. In fact, the Nazis, well, they were putting the star of Rimfan on the Jews. They worshiped what's called the black sun, which is still the same planet, Saturn. And if you look at Saturn, and I believe it's the southern pole, that there is literally a hexagram, permanent hexagram in the cloud figures on the bottom of Saturn. And one of the reasons for this, many speculate, is that when you look at the rings of Saturn and what's going on, there's basically a Hadron Collider built naturally into Saturn, which not only will cause the magnetic for, for a hexagram, uh, or not hex, the hexagram, or a, or a pentagram, or, yeah, hexagram, at the bottom, but also causes the rings because there's many believe that that is where the uh, where Tarsus is, where some of the ancient watchers were incarcerated. They believe there's a, in fact it's also called the black cube. Is connected to Saturn. And see the the, the whole thing about this, guys, is Jew or Gentile. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. None of us can appear before Him and have our heads lifted up. We all need a Savior. Salvation is first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. But he was saying, listen, as they were getting ready to stone Him, Stephen gave an indictment before them. You did not carry the name of God properly in the earth. And that still speaks to us today. We dealt that with the last session on how many false idols that we claimed were Jesus. We have the Malibu Jesus, the Prosperity Jesus, the New Age Jesus, the Methodist Jesus that would make John Wesley roll over in the grave. We have the Catholic Jesus that requires Mary to be a co-salvation partner with him in the earth. But we also need to understand how this stuff was preached in the New Testament dynamic, as well as how Paul was not only uh, trying to correct the rabbis of his day, but also of how he was teaching Torah to the Gentiles. Let's go to Romans chapter 2, verses 23 and 20, uh, through 29. You know, it's amazing to me how many of us Gentiles will go to the book of Romans and will quote a snippet, we're not under the law, And we forget the paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of how Paul was telling the rabbis, you know Torah, you can't keep it. They don't know Torah, but they're keeping it. Which was evidence of the Brit Hadashah, or the expanded covenant. We forget all about that. But I want you to see some things, Romans starting with verse 23. Thou that makest thy boast in the law... Though breaking the law dishonorous, uh, though breaking the law dishonorous, thou God. So he's saying, okay, you boast in the law, but when you break it, you're dishonoring God. Now look what the allegation he makes with them. And this actually refers to what the prophets wrote: "For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, for as it is written." Now, that is not only an indictment to the Jewish people in the Second Temple period, it's also an indictment to the church, because how many places within paganism and within our society is the name of Jesus blasphemed because of the way that we conduct ourselves? And the theologies that we have made that appease to our carnal nature. But listen, listen to his reasoning here. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if you break the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, now verse 26, you need to underline this in your Bible. Therefore, if the uncircumcised keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. In other words, he's talking about the greater circumcision, the circumcision of the heart. And shall not the uncircumcision which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is on the outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, 
and circumcision is that of the heart in spirit and not in letter, whose praise is not of men, but by God, or but to God. Now this is a whole dynamic, a whole can of worms, the Apostle Paul saying, he said, now who is a Jew? Now he's talking about matters of the heart, not ethnicity. But one out of their hearts keep the law of God. And so one of the things this is doing is this is connecting by the power of the Holy Spirit and Messiah within. We are walking in the ways of God. Therefore, by doing that, we no longer cause the name of God to be blasphemed and, and betreaded underfoot of men. Jesus said it another way, if the salt has lost its savor, it will be trotted under the feet of men. One of the reasons the church in America is trotted under the feet of men, we thought we, we, we somehow confused the church with Baskin Robbins. We got 39 flavors of Jesus. How many know there's only one, and it's the Jesus of the Bible, which is the God of the Old Testament, come in flesh, who's the one who gave the commandments to Moses, and now when you're studying Torah, how do you learn to apply it to your life? What is crucial to us really learning how to walk out the Torah? You read the Gospels. Because the only one who ever got it right was Jesus. Men would have 570,000 laws regarding Sabbath. And they got mad at Jesus, not because he ever violated Moses, but because he healed on the Sabbath. And when you understand Sabbath is a divine rehearsal of the millennial reign, the most natural thing to do for the Messiah is to bring healing on the Sabbath. It was actually a banner saying, I am Messiah. That's one of the reasons they said, quit healing on the Sabbath. Like it was something he did in himself, rather than it be by the Spirit of God. And he said, listen, you guys got six days a week to do it, and you can't do it, so I might as well do it on the Sabbath. Paul encourages believers. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, in the King James, vocation kind of really throws off the modern reader because we think a vocation is, I'm going to be a welder, I'm going to be a truck driver. That is not what it meant in 1611. That is not what it meant when Paul was expressing it here. So to avoid that minefield, I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Version today. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal to and beg you to walk, lead a life worthy of the divine call to which which you have been called with a behavior that is a credit to the summons to God's service. Now, what was our call? Come walk with me, and I'll make you what you can't be without me. You see, the more Abraham Abram walked with God. It was him walking with God and, and learning how to no longer think like a Babylonian, but think like someone walking with God, that he went from Abram to Abraham. That's our calling, to come out of Egypt, to come out of Babylon, and now begin walking in the kingdom. And so he said, listen, that's your calling. People always write me and say, I need to know my calling. I need to understand what my calling is. All of us have the exact same calling. To walk in the kingdom. Secondarily, I'm an apostolic teacher. But that's my secondary calling. My primary calling is to walk with Almighty God and to walk in the kingdom. And one of the things that we discussed up in New York, you know, you always, it, it, it seems like within the church that just as soon as a baby is born, they're trying to speak or that he's going to be a pastor, he's going to be a prophet or whatever. Instead of really understanding the Hebraic concept of raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it, not only is it dealing with the ways of God, but how many know that not everybody can be a preacher? Not everybody can be a prophet. I mean, in this day and age, wouldn't it be nice to have a Holy Ghost-filled, blood-bought banker that actually walks in integrity, or a politician, or an attorney, or a contractor, 
You see, one of the problems we have here in Missouri is you can't find anybody that will keep the word when it comes to, you know, doing uh, construction work and stuff. My, what a gym that would be with somebody that always kept their word. And, and then you didn't need to have a mile-long contract. Their handshake and their word was their bond. And if it was humanly possible, they would always keep their word. You see, that's what a believer does. Or to have somebody that you hire to work for you, instead of finding the easiest way, they always do it the right way because it honors God. That's why the Apostle Paul says, whatever you say in word and deed, do it as unto the Lord. You're not just doing it for your employer because the way that you live is a testimony of who you walk with. And so he's, here he is now teaching Gentiles this very real concept. You, your service, whether you're a merchant whether you're a homekeeper, whether you're an attorney, no matter what you are, it is a service to God, and how you conduct your life is a testimony of Him in you. And the word Christian, originally, that's what it meant. In Antioch, there was so much being like Jesus, they literally called them, you just want to be like a little Jesus just running around, a little Christian. And now... 2,000 years later, many of them that bear the name of Christ, you can't find Christ in them anywhere, in their attitudes, in their theologies. It's all about giving the people what they want, which takes us right back to Malachi. And I think we're in the process right now of God judging the modern Levites for teaching the people what they wanted to hear instead of what they needed to hear. And how many know that we need to walk better than that for God? Let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. You see, the, the disciples, when they looked at what Jesus could do, and they said, you know, we've, we've, we've had rabbis teach us how to pray. We, the Pharisees have taught us how to pray. The Sadducees say pray this way. But you know what? We've, we've watched you. And you're different, Jesus. And so, it has to be your prayer life. And so, Jesus says, here's, here's how you pray. And, you know, we can all call our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We skip over that and don't even know the significance of it. Everybody, just like today, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways of trying to promote myself on the internet I refuse to do because it's grandstanding. How many times have I, has a, an article title, you know, caught, your, caught my attention, I went to it, and then the article was nothing about what they promised in the title. It was because there, there, is, there is such a den of noise on the internet. And so in Jesus' day, they didn't have the internet, but they had the social square, and you had this Pharisee competing against this Pharisee, and then the Pharisees competing against the Sadducees, and everybody was one-upping everything else, and it was always, a, and so they, they literally had this little uh, public relations little thing running around in their heads. Everything they did was jockeying themselves for a position within society, within their communities within the pecking order of whatever order that they happen to be in. And Jesus comes along, and he doesn't care about any of that. He just says, I've come to do the will of him who sent me. And so when he prays, this is one of the most powerful formulas for prayer. Because everybody, you know, we always get into, oh, give us our, day, our daily bread, forgive us of our sins. Oh, your kingdom come. We forget the first of it. Let your name be hallowed in my life. Let your name be hallowed in my family. Let your name be hallowed. Let me walk worthy of you. Let, by the way that I conduct myself, never let, my, never let what I do bring reproach on your name. Jesus said that is the secret to walking in the power of the kingdom. Your name be hallowed. Let them forget my name. It's your name. And then in this earthen vessel, I want your will, not mine, to be done. That's, he said that's the secret to prayer. 
That's what, that's what separated Jesus from all the religious leaders of his day. Was God first, kingdom first. You're on down in the pecking order somewhere else. Jesus really didn't care about public relations. He preached a hard sermon one day, and uh, when you understand Second Temple period theology, when he said, you need to drink my blood and eat my flesh, they knew it referred back to the Passover and all these different things. They understood the concepts when you read, uh, when you read the writings of that time period before Jesus came. They were very familiar with those colloquialisms. But it made everybody mad, and thousands of people that were following him all left, and all he had was the 12. And he looked at them and said, you guys going to leave too? Jesus was not seeker-friendly. Jesus was not public relations-friendly. He was father-friendly. I'm going to speak the words that he gives me. If you don't like it, there's the door. And then you tell your own ministry team, y'all going to leave too. It's okay, I'll go out in the field, I'll get me 12 more, we'll start this whole thing all over again. He didn't care. Because it was about what it did for the name of God. So with all this in context, let's look at one of the most famous charismatic verses in all the Bible. Let's go to John chapter 16. You take this out of context, you take this out of Hebraic context and everything that I have taught, this becomes a formula that I can, oh oh God, give me a Lexus, oh God, give me a mansion, oh God, give me a new jet, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, which is really the way the faith movement has done this, and they have taken it completely out of context. And I need to drill this into your head. Any verse taken out of context becomes a pretext. A pretext is something that really sounds good, but isn't true. He's taught them. They they understood the concept of bearing the name of God, the weight and the power of it. He taught them, you pray that more than anything else, God's name be hallowed in the earth by the way that you conduct yourself in the kingdom. And so that's very real on the inside of them. They understand what it means to bear the name of another. Israel had the name of God placed on them, and he was, they were his family in the earth. And they were to be his evangelists because they were to be so different and so blessed that all the mystery religions looked up and said, you got something better than we got. Okay? So in the context of that culture, he tells them, In that day ye shall ask me nothing, verily, verily, or truly, truly. And he's almost like swearing an oath. I say unto you, whatsoever you ask the Father, in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I, will not, and I shall not say unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have, and have believed that I come from God. Now, the whole concept of Hebraic love. God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Shema Israel, Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. All this comes into context that now he is saying, Now you bear my name, and when you come before the Father, you're representing me. Uh Uh-oh. So it ain't God's going to make me rich. I'm I'm going to drive the, I'm going to, I've got to drive a Lexus because of God's reputation. No, you're not. Some of the, some of the people that I have seen that carry the, the, the reputation of God and the glory of God the best sometimes drive old beat up vehicles. I was shocked at what I saw Henry Groover drive up to, and, and he, when this last year when I was in Dallas, 
Come to find out, instead of him flying, he drove down somewhere else and was preaching there. And, and I mean, he, he was driving what I, as a younger man, wouldn't even think about keeping up that schedule. He's driving, and it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a modern, you know, more modern car. It's not like he drove something 30 years old, but it, it was what we would call a, a mid-range vehicle. As, as much as he has done all over the earth. But I tell you what, when the moment that he, he looked up and he greeted me, I could see God in his face. Because it's not about the vehicle. How many know heaven doesn't care if you have a Rolex watch on your wrist or not? God doesn't, you know, give me this day my daily bread. Meet my needs. I don't see anything about once. God can many times give you once, but it's gravy on the side because you've been faithful. But it's the needs. And so when I come to the Father in the name of Jesus, I've got to pray just like Jesus would pray in that situation. I've got to, I, I, I have got to so understand Him and represent Him that now the Holy Spirit is guiding my prayer life, crucifying the flesh, and I begin praying the way that Jesus prayed because I can only get the results Jesus got when I pray the way He prayed and I allow the Holy Spirit to change me to match Him. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering Heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.